Okay, let's get started. Uh, welcome to our presentation this afternoon. Uh, I'm Bob Norman. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the York County Historical Committee. And it's uh, our pleasure to introduce the speaker for today's program, uh, Mike Sincere. Sincere. I knew I was going to do it that way. Michael is a historian, uh, an educator, a speaker, an interpreter, and a reenactor. And he also is a prolific author. He's written over 20 books and numerous articles on the American Revolution and the Revolutionary War, focusing mainly on Virginia. And this includes his recently released uh, book titled Williamsburg at War, which is the subject of our presentation this afternoon. And this uh, book, as well as other works by Mike, will be available downstairs <coughs> when the author will uh, be selling and signing them if you would like to, to get one. So now that we know a little bit about him, let me turn it over to Mike Cicere. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. So um, our topic today is Williamsburg at War. And let me explain where this whole idea came from. I, I was fortunate to move to Williamsburg in uh, 2017. And uh, we, this, we, my wife and I built our kind of forever home um, over at Queens Lake. And we're absolutely thrilled and loved it. We, loved it. we lived in uh, Northern Virginia in Prince William County. And I, I taught at Lee High School. Now it's um, John L. Lewis High School in Springfield in Fairfax County. But my last four years, I got, to, I got to teach in Gloucester, and I loved that. It was really just a wonderful school, wonderful kids and all. Um, but now I'm retired, and I'm, spoke, I'm focused on the revolution. I've been writing since 2004. I've been a reenactor for 25 years, since 1999. So, um, and that's, well, that's probably the impetus for my interest in the revolution. But Williamsburg is, too. So when we moved here, and I'd walk my dog, first Sadie, my beloved, beloved Sadie, who I dedicate the book to, uh, she passed a year ago, and now my new dog, um, um, Daisy, uh, we just walk around the town. And so I've got a Frenchman's map for you right now to kind of get you, for those of you that aren't, aren't um, familiar with what we're talking about here, this is what Williamsburg essentially looked like 250 years ago or so. And I'm assuming, yep, that works. And so if you look right here, that's the Palace Green. That's the Duke, uh, Duke of Gloucester Street. The, over here's the Capitol. On the other end is, uh, is uh, the college of William and Mary. And I'm not going to point out every, every, uh, every uh, um, site or every building on this map, but these, these ravines. What I'm really excited about is this creek right back here. This creek back here, I, well, my dog always insists, Daisy always insists that we go and visit it uh, when we go walking. And it's still there. It's right behind the printer shop. So this, again, this, this map was drawn, they think, in, I think, 1782. Um, by a French officer, and they think it was essentially um, a, a map to show places where the troops that are staying, and I'll get to the, uh, what the f French are doing in Williamsburg in just a little bit, or at the end of the, pro uh, of the talk, actually. But essentially, um, th these are places where, oops, these are places where they could uh, um, be. So this is uh, where they could stay, you know, quarters uh, and all that. Again, the palace green and all. Now, um, a close-up of the eastern portion of the town. There's the capital again. Um, a close-up of the uh, of the palace green and all. And we'll come back to that. And for those of you that are, aren't from around here, to put it put it in context of where we're at, you see Williamsburg on the map here. Here, um, Richmond's up there. That's going to be a very important thing uh, at near the end of the uh, end of the talk. And there's going to be a lot of activity down here in Portsmouth and Norfolk and Hampton and and all that. That is part of the story. Okay, let's talk about Williamsburg. Why I wrote the book itself is because I wanted to know more about Williamsburg. I just wanted to know more what is going on. I, you walk by and you see all these little um, signs on each one of the houses that uh, Colonial Williamsburg has preserved and, and maintained and, and rebuilt in some cases. And so I wanted to know more. So um, I started using a lot of their own research, which you, anybody can access online. And so I'm, you just, I discovered that the city of Williamsburg, it was a city chartered in 1722, has rough, almost 2,000 permanent residents there. Okay, 900 or over 900 are white, approximately 1,000 are black, most of them are enslaved. But more important, I mean, not more importantly, but, but what I really want to focus on is what's going on there. What are these 2,000 people doing? Uh, because that's not bigger than Norfolk, and Norfolk is a much bigger city than, uh, than, than Williamsburg. 
what's going on here? Because we're not on a, we're not on a, we don't have a natural harbor, Lori, Fredericksburg and Norfolk and all these, Alexandria, all these other places um, in, I mean, I should say, in Virginia have. We've got 27 stores around the eve of the war. We've got, we've got uh, 12 taverns. Something's wrong there. I'm afraid we might have the wrong um, map here. Um, we've got 12 taverns, all kinds of apothecaries or druggists, tailors, milliners, wig makers. Um, you've got cabinet makers. It's all the shops that you see when you go there now. They're all there, and, and Colonial Williamsburg has done a good job of uh, basically um, recreating them. And so this is a place where uh, there's a lot of economic activity. Now, I volunteer at Williamsburg as a farmer, and one of the things we talk about uh, when, when we're doing our farming um, uh, and we're, we're interpreting is that 90% of Virginians in this time period are growing tobacco and farming, all right? This is the kind of mi my small minority that are finding other ways to make a living and all that. Uh, why? Why are all these people, uh, what's, what's going on? What's happening is that um, uh, government, the gov Williamsburg is like any state capital today. Have you guys ever been to your own state capital? You're in Richmond on a Saturday or a Sunday? It's a different city than on a Wednesday. And so what happens is uh, when the House of Burgesses is in session in the Capitol building or when the... Um, when, uh, when the courts are meeting, the city swells up. That's why you have so many taverns. There weren't taverns listed on that list like there should have been. There's over a dozen taverns uh, in that last list. Now, very quickly, I just wanted to go over the uh, government and how it was all set up. They don't have a democratic government, a small d, the way we think of it. They don't, you don't, they don't have town elections at all. What they have is something formed in 1722. It's called a common hall. And what they, what, 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 what they started with was 12 council which is basically the lower uh, house, and then six aldermen, that's the upper house, and these 18 people that were appointed by the king that first time, they get to decide who replaces them. Uh, or, or actually, the one, you know, if somebody dies, then the others decide who replaces them. So there's never really a town election. But what's interesting is, and by the way, I also pro uh, throw out that these prominent names, the governor obviously lives in Williamsburg, Peyton Randolph, the most prominent man in Virginia, um, the, uh, the Randolph House, I hope you get to visit there one day, um, future president of the Continental Congress, his brother, the Attorney General, uh, Peyton Randolph was the Speaker of the House of Burgesses, uh, Robert Carter Nicholas, the Treasurer of the Colony, and then George Wythe, the Clerk, but also a, you know, a brilliant legal mind. They're all residents of Williamsburg, and many of their residences still stand. But I wanted to point out these other names, too. You can go to the Everard House. You can go and see where Dr. Pastor practiced, uh, practiced medicine. Um, I think the, one of the Blairs, I don't know which one it is, uh, ha, the, their residence still stands. Okay? The Getty House is open to the public. Um, Craig, the, Craig's house, uh, Alexander Craig, the saddle maker, Benjamin Powell's house is open to the public. So you, all these names, and some of these guys are towns, townsfolk, um, you know, tradesmen, they're not planters in the uh, upper elite, this group here on the council. So it's kind of neat in that way. So in, in, although it's not, what I'm trying to say is that although the Williamsburg's government isn't Democrat, in terms of elections, it is representative of uh, at least the free population of Williamsburg in 1775. It's not just a bunch of planters that are in charge the way the House of Burgesses looks like. That's what I'm trying to say. The House of Burgesses is, is much less representative than, say, the, 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 the city government of, uh, of Williamsburg. All right, moving on now. Now, I'm just going to point out some key places uh, uh, for folks, and then I'm going to talk about events that happened there. Obviously, you've got, that, uh, you've got the House of Burgesses here in, in Williamsburg. Uh, this is the capital with an O. That's the Raleigh Tavern. A lot of important things happened in the Raleigh, and I'm pointing now to the Apollo Room. That's where, on two different occasions, really important meetings in 1769 and in 1774 were held after the Burgesses were dismissed from, from uh, the house. Uh, they were basically dissolved by the governor. They go over to a bar. I love that. And they basically get the, uh, sit in the tavern and say, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Okay, other important places, obviously, the governor's palace just stands out. You can't, you know, you can't think of Williamsburg without the governor's palace. Now, our first two elected governors are going to live there, too. Patrick Henry and Thomas Jefferson. You got, um, you've got the, um, the powder magazine, obviously, is important. I'm going to have a little story there. The courthouse, the county courthouse, that's James City County's courthouse. York County was right here. Um, and, of course, the, the church 
uh, oh, the, the, um, the, the church, Bruton Parish Church, and then the Wren Building, which is the College of William and Mary. Okay, now, let's talk a little bit of important events that happened. And I, let me go back one. I don't want to... All right, it is 1773, 250 years ago, 250 years ago from now, 1773. And in December, I think it was the 16th of December of that year, a bunch of rowdy Massachusetts or uh, malcontents, as they're sometimes referred to by people down here, uh, break on in onto ship, the three ships and dump tea into the harbor. They dump all this tea into the harbor. And here in Virginia, I've got, uh, and I write about it, I've got re reactions from, say, uh, Edmund Pendleton of Caroline County saying, you know, I don't, I don't agree with that. Most Virginians did not agree with the destruction of private property. But everybody held their breath. What's going to happen next? They just dumped thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of tea into the harbor. What's Parliament going to do? Well, that shoe drops in May of 1774 when they announced essentially what we call the Intolerable Acts. Boston Harbor is closed. Um, until the people that did this and the t are, are identified and the tea is paid for. Um, the Boston is occupied by thousands of British troops. The, Bo the Massachusetts charter is suspended. Okay, so they do, they do a series of, uh, of kind of measures that we lump together and call the Intel Blacks. Everybody's reaction is the same uh, in, in Virginia. <gasps> wow. Okay, you, you guys know that old thing of killing a little gnat with like a sledgehammer? Wham! That's too much. I've learned this the hard way as a teacher. There's, it's called proportional response, okay? They did, I mean, those guys in Massachusetts did something, you know, illegal and, and really upset them. But these guys overreacted. As I sometimes did as a teacher, I would overreact, and then the whole situation would blow up in my face. Well, that's what happened in 1774. When Parliament overreacted, this is the way I used to teach it, and I still maintain this, they were trying to intimidate. They were trying to get everybody in the colonies to go, oh, did you see what happened about Massachusetts because of what they did? We don't want to do that. We don't want a piece of that. They were hoping everybody would back away and poor Massachusetts would just be left there, you know, to, to, to kind of die on the vine, so to speak. But instead, their overreaction in Parliament caused us to rally, us meaning the colonists, to rally. So it was actually, um, oh, going the wrong way again, sorry. It was actually the Burgesses right here who stand up, oh, I'm pushing the wrong button, who stand up in late May of 1774 and say, we got to do something. What can we do? Are you ready for this? This was the reaction that Virginia, Virginia came up with. They said, let's pray. Let's pray for them and fast for them because June 1st is the date this all goes into effect, so we'll all go to church and pray for the people of Boston. Now, that's a pretty timid and, and gentle, you know, sign of support. And yet the governor was furious. Governor Dunmore was furious because he said, they don't have the right to call a day of prayer or fasting. So he dissolved the parliament. So what did they do? They went to the bar. They marched over to the Raleigh Tavern and they said, okay, now what are we going to do? And this is where things really start to heat up because um, 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 the, the committees of correspondence have been around for over a year and letters start coming in that, um, that, uh, from the North saying, we want to meet, we want to meet. And so by the time we're done with uh, two days of meetings, we're sending delegates to Philadelphia. Wow. And to a Continental Congress. That's a big step, guys. That's a big step. All of a sudden, 12 of 13, anybody know which colony didn't send delegates to the first Congress? Georgia. Poor Georgia. But they will. They'll see the light soon. Okay. Meanwhile, while that's going on there, remember, my focus is really what's going on in Williamsburg. So the next thing to talk about in Williamsburg, um, once the delegation, and it was quite a delegation, by the way. It was Peyton Randolph, uh, George Washington, Patrick Henry, um, uh, Mr. Harrison, um, Pendleton was there. There were seven altogether. All right, Williamsburg does something that most of the counties in Virginia don't do. They form their own independent militia company. Now, Fairfax County was first, Prince William County did it too, Spotsylvania County, Caroline County I think did it, uh, so, but there were six that I've counted so far, and Williamsburg was one of them. Now, what are these guys? Well, they are their own individual volunteer militia. 
All right, and so they're they're not sanctioned by the the, the regular channels, which is the governor, and then um, what in counties it was called a county lieutenant. These guys are kind of going off the script here a little bit. Well, the governor's out of town. The governor went off to the, to, to fight Shawnee Indians out west uh, when this happened, and when he got back, this militia militia company met, uh, kind of went to greet him. He did not approve. You know, I'm not, I'm not happy that you've done this. And he writes this scathing letter about Virginia being all in revolt, and he sends it off to Parliament. That letter's going to come back to haunt him in a little bit. Okay, you guys ready? You, you with me? Because now, this is the moment. We all, in, in two years, less than two years, we're all going to celebrate um, or going to commemorate um, the shot heard around the world at Lexington and Concord, April 19th. But here in Williamsburg, they didn't even hear about that until April, April 29th. Here in Williamsburg, we were worked up about what happened on April 21st. And what happened was that guy right there, Governor Dunmore, sent, uh, hands the key to the pub powder magazine to a British officer on a ship called the Mag Magdalene, anchored off the, uh, the James River. And as soon as he sees that the, the, uh, the coast is clear, in other words, that, that independent militia company I told you about, they, they had heard rumors that there was going to be an attempt to steal the gunpowder out of the magazine. So they'd been guarding the, the magazine for several nights. So on the first night that they kind of lowered their guard, 20 British sailors and Marines from that ship go in and steal 15 barrels of gunpowder. They're caught on their way out. They escape with the gunpowder, but the whole town is awakened with the alarm. Now, guys, think for a second what the British in Massachusetts were looking for when they left Boston on April 18th that night, and they marched, they crossed the, the bay there, the river, and they marched to Lexington and then to Concord. Why? What were they looking for? Gunpowder, arms, and maybe even some uh, leaders, if they could get John Adams or uh, Hancock, that would be good too. But it was weapons. All right, so they do the same thing here on the 21st, and Dunmore has to backpedal because the crowd, the Williamsburg is all alarmed, and they want, they want, you know, they want their powder back. He's, he's able to talk his way out of it. A delegation sent to, the, to his house, and uh, he basically says, oh, I moved it because of, I was afraid that the slaves might rebel. There's rumors of them rising up, and they might break in and, and arm themselves, so I want to put it more secure. On a British ship, theoretically, it would be more secure. Everybody, everybody took that. They, they, they grumbled about it, but they accepted that. And then, guess what? The news from the North shows up on the 29th, and it's like, hey, did you hear what happened in Massachusetts? What were they looking for? Gunpowder. Coincidence? Mm -mm. Okay, this right here, April 21st, really important date here in Virginia, and that's going to get the ball rolling. I want you to notice that right here, this guy right here. This is my friend, Mr. Patrick Henry here. And he, uh, he basically is the most popular man in Virginia, and when he hears about all this with the gunpowder, he basically ra raises a, a force of volunteers to march on Williamsburg. Because, by the way, he was at Scotchtown getting ready to go back to Philadelphia for the Second Continental Congress. So he's going to come to Williamsburg with an armed force and get that gunpowder back. When Dunmore hears about this, now we're into early May. When Dunmore hears about this, he basically threatens to burn the whole town down and free the slaves to fight for him. I will free them, and they'll fight for me, and I'll burn this town to the ground. Wow. Luckily, cooler heads intervened, and they negotiated a settlement where Henry stopped uh, a, a day's march away at a tavern, again, Doncastle Tavern, and uh, basically uh, he was offered 330 pounds for payment of the gunpowder that was taken away, and then Henry took that note and went to Philadelphia and tried to buy gunpowder to replace it. So that was that compromise that averted a disaster. All right, what happens next? Dunmore flees. About a month later, Dunmore flees. Remember the letters I told you that he wrote in December? Well, there are people in Parliament that are on our side. And when those letters are, 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 are kind of expressed in Parliament, some of our allies write down what was said and then send it back here. So when we find out our very governor, who's supposed to be looking out for us, is literally coaching or urging British officials to crack down on us, that's bad news. And Dunmore, I think, was tipped off that th his letters were about to be published in the newspaper, and that's one reason he fled on June 8th. And he fled right here to Yorktown. Well, he, actually, he fled to a British ship uh, in, the, uh, in the 
Queen's Creek, and then they went down and went on to a bigger British ship in the York River. So he wasn't in Yorktown, he was right off the, off the uh, river. Oh, um, so what happens, what happens next? Uh, Dunmore's writing letters about how the whole city's been taken over by a bunch of ruffians and all that, and um, we worry that he's that the British are going to come, there are rumors flying all over the place, the British are coming to us next because they're sending more troops over. So we prepare for war. So you have, this slide you're looking at is kind of neat. And what I want to focus on is the very first militia from outside of Williamsburg that shows up, and they start camping right over here in what is called Waller's Grove back then. Now, this is a map of where the American army was in 1781, but it's still a good map. Um, this is Waller's Grove. So you could go and catch just the tail end of it today when you go over there. I think I have a picture of it. Yeah, yeah, over behind the Powell House and such. And they're camped there. And you get this interesting situation of uh, 250 volunteers from New Kent and Charles City, some as far as Albemarle, and they're all camped there, and there's no direction. 250 armed men, no direction. So what do they do? They go to the taverns. They hang out. They and their discipline is horrible. They elect a captain, Captain Charles Scott. Now, Charles Scott is going to be a brigadier general in the Continental Army, a uh, you know, Virginia brigadier. But at the time, he's a captain with a little bit of French and Indian War experience, and they, they elect him. But he's too soft on the men. He's too soft. If you fall asleep on guard duty, that's a pretty serious thing. Well, you are confined to your tent for two hours. Confined to your tent for two hours, you know? And so there's no real discipline. And, and one of his fellow officers writes about it and says, look, he, he's, he's a good man, but he's too soft. And we spend more time in the taverns than we do doing anything militarily. So things aren't working out very well uh, for this military. But Dunmore has next to nothing, so we're, we're not really in that much danger. All right. I, I mentioned the... I didn't really mention it. We've had, we have Virginia conventions, the first Virginia. The second Virginia is where Patrick Henry says, I don't know what the rest of you do, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. He did that up in Richmond. The third Virginia convention creates a better military, and it names Patrick Henry and William Woodford to be in charge of two regiments of Virginia regulars. Now, regulars serve for a year in this case. They're going to be full-time soldiers, not these militia. They're going to be all sent home. Now, why is this important to the story of Williamsburg? Because they, they all come to Williamsburg. A thousand men from all over the colony are coming, and they're going to camp right behind the, uh, the, the, the college, right, right in this area here. And it's going to be like two, two or three months of just a thousand men um, trying to get outfitted, trying to get equipped, uh, practicing the drills and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's, it's a pretty neat uh, uh, situation. Okay, so right here, if you go to behind, behind the Wren Building today, that's kind of what um, the William and Mary looks like today from a bird's eye view. So we're talking about where the sunken garden part is, and right behind there, um, there's a little flat area before the garden. And that's where these guys camped. And so September, October, November, there's going to be a lot of troop activity. It looks like an armed camp in Williamsburg. Um, and, and pretty exciting stuff are going on. Now, Meanwhile, Dunmore has, has left Yorktown and sailed down to Norfolk, okay? And he's, he's on a ship in Norfolk uh, and, and all. Um, but he's also having a little bit of trouble over in Hampton. And he has got a, there's a British captain named Captain Matthew Squire who has a grudge with Hampton. I guess I'll go into it really, really quickly. You got, I heard you guys talk about hurricanes when I came in here. In early September, a hurricane came ripping on through Virginia, and it, and it blew a, sh a little tender. A tender is a small escort vessel or auxiliary vessel to a big, bigger uh, warship. And he was on this little tender with a small crew, and it got blown up the shore right, somewhere over here in, uh, in Back Creek, I think, over here, Back River. And um, he escaped, but his crew was captured. The ship was burned, and the stuff inside of it were stolen. So what happens is he's mad. He wants Hampton to pay. First he wants them to return the boat, but he can't. It's gone. So uh, then he says, well, at least, you know, give back the equipment. And Hampton just laughs at him. Ha, 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 ha. And so uh, some troops from Williamsburg are sent down to Hampton. And in late October, Captain Squire sails five small vessels in the Hampton River. He's going to burn down Hampton. Okay? Now, guys... Almost the exact same thing is happening almost the exact same time in Portland, Maine, called Falmouth, Massachusetts then, where that city does get burned down. Um, in this case, 
uh, the Virginia militia and a, a company of Culpeper Minutemen riflemen and Colonel William Woodford, they all fight from shore to keep the British from landing and burning um, Hampton, and so they succeed and they drive the British away. But that's, why is this all important? Because up to this point, I want you to think about this for a second. I've got to be back here. There's been no fighting in Williamsburg, uh, in Virginia, okay? The war's been going on for six months, right? April, May, June, July, August, September, October. Six months, George Washington has been up there with the Continental Army. Daniel Morgan has gone up there with the riflemen and all that. So there are Virginians in the war, but we're not fighting here in Virginia at all. But that at Hampton is where the first bloodshed and the first shots are fired. A month later, there's a, a small little skirmish in which the a local militia of Prince's Ann County are routed and um, Kemp's landing, and then Dunmore does it. He, he, he follows through on his threat. He issues a proclamation. Because of this victory, he basically says, all enslaved men, basically is what he's uh, aiming at, all enslaved men of rebels who come to me and fight for me will get their freedom. So he's not offering freedom to everybody. He's only offering it to enslaved men who will fight of rebels, okay, and then he writes that hundreds take him up on that, and so he's very confident that he's going to be able to just create this kind of homegrown force that will eventually restore British authority here, here in Virginia, but he stumbles at the Battle of Great Bridge, uh, the Battle of Great Bridge, which I'm not going to get into the details of, but aside from, uh, he sends about, he's only got about 150 redcoats that were sent up from Florida to help out, and he loses half of them in the Battle of Great Bridge, uh, unwisely attacking a fortified position and all that. Um, that's going on down in this area while the government in, in Williamsburg is meeting and trying to decide what to do next. You know, what, what are we going to do next? What they do, what I should have said, oh, right there, what they do, uh, in December is they enlarge the army from two regiments to nine regiments, all right? That's a big increase. Now, all of a sudden, we're going from 2,000 men to, you know, seven or 6,000 uh, Continentals and all that. Plus, there's a whole other Minuteman battalion contingent, too. So that's what the spring's all about, getting more, getting more and more uh, revved up. Dunmore does not go away for another six months, but he's kind of isolated. Big events in Williamsburg that happened in 1776 include uh, Virginia's vote for independence. Now, so when you go to the House of Burgesses and you visit there, and you, I know it's recreated and they kind of got it off a, a wrong a little bit, but you're still standing on the spot where American independence is really born because nobody, none of the other colonies would act until Virginia acted. They're all waiting for Virginia to lead the way. You remember North Carolina, they love to say that they were first, but nobody cared. It's North Carolina. I'm sorry, North Carolina. I love you guys. I do. But you're not, you're not significant enough to, to lead the way. And Massachusetts wanted to, but nobody wanted to follow them because, as we know from the musical 1776, they're obnoxious, right? John Adams, obnoxious. So everybody waited for Virginia. So it was uh, Richard Henry Lee on June 7th who stands up on behalf of Virginia in, the, in Philadelphia to declare that Virginia is proposing independence, has voted for independence. So while that happens there, we're creating our own new government, okay? And so the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which is basically the precursor to the Bill of Rights, happens in Williamsburg. We also elect our first governor to replace Dunmore. So, you know, we're, we're going, we're just blazing forward. Okay, I'm gonna take a pause here. Oh, there's one more to mention, Gwynn's Island. Um, Let's get rid of Dunmore, right? Let's get Dunmore. You guys know where Gwynn's Island is? It's not that far away, right? Gloucester guys. Uh, and so um, he, had, he, he moves in May. He moves from Norfolk to Gwynn's Island, and he thinks he's okay there. But uh, in July, he's driven off. And by then, he's, his, a lot of his troops have died of smallpox. A lot of the enslaved people that joined him have died of smallpox and other illnesses. And so he quits. He just leaves. And that's important. When the British leave, when Dunmore leaves Virginia, it basically removes any possibility of Virginia being a um, kind of a second front, okay? And it also frees up those those regiments I told you are forming, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. And just like that, uh, Dunmore leaves, two regiments are sent north, and then three more after that. And those regiments play a crucial role in November and December of 1776 
during the low, low, one of the lowest points of the whole war for us, those regiments are kind of the heart, uh, big heart or big part of the, the, the troops that uh, attack Trenton, right, across the Delaware. Those are Virginians that are there. And they wouldn't be there if Dunmore hadn't left when he left, is, is my contention. To, the, the, there's a connection there. All right, let's get back into Williamsburg itself. This is the kind of little lull. Um, I've always said that Virginia and Williamsburg is the same thing. A lot of action in the beginning, a lot of action at the end, not much in the beginning. So this is the blacksmith shop, um, and I talk about how that expands into an armory to, to build weapons and such. They try, they have to manufacture. We, we got almost all of our fabric from Great Britain before the war, linen and, and wool. So now down by um, um, Queens Creek, there's a little spot. In fact, I swear this building is still there. Uh, in some form, um, and basically they build this little factory to make linen, so they're trying to be more self-sufficient that way. Um, they build a massive barrack somewhere in the back. I don't know where. I've heard it's further away than this. I, I thought it was over here, but a big uh, wooden barracks is for troops uh, in 76, 77. Um, the Cherokee Indian come in. There was a war with the Cherokee out west in 76, and now they, uh, the representatives of, of the Cherokee Nation come, and they signed some sort of agreement in, in May of 1777. Um, these things are going on because most of the fighting is happening outside of Virginia. Patrick Henry serves three one-year terms. That's, that's the limit. We start to have trouble raising new troops by 78 because the war, and like every war that you can probably remember, goes longer than everybody expected. The current one, the Ukrainian thing with, uh, with the Russians, you know, when we went into Iraq, everyone is like, boy, this is going on a lot further. Except, I guess, Gulf, the, the one, the first Gulf Storm one, that one pretty fast. Um, almost every other one, like our expectations aren't met. Now, this is interesting. Well, look what I've got highlighted here. In 1778, the um, new, now we have a new government, right? It's called uh, the General Assembly now, the same one we live with today basically passes a law in 78 that says no more slaves to be imported into Virginia. None. We don't want any more slaves imported here. Now, on the surface, that says, wow, that's cool. That's a step toward, uh, toward freedom and all that. But it might have been more of an economic, cultural de de decision than a, than a kind of a good-natured, uh, let's, let's uh, emancipate slaves and all. Um, but again, it's there, October 1778, uh, the, the General Assembly puts a ban on on um, bringing more slaves in. You could bring, if you move to Virginia from Maryland, you can bring your property. That's what, unfortunately what, what enslaved people were considered property. You could bring them in. But you can't bring over new slave ships uh, from other areas to, to, say, to sell. All right, other events in 79, the Collier Raid. Uh, it doesn't really affect Williamsburg that much. Thomas Jefferson's election, he takes over as the new governor. Um, the, the Collier Raid, I, I, I misspoke. It, the Collier Raid, Matthew, Coll Matthew and Collier, they're two people. That raid actually does affect Williamsburg because it gives the proponents of those in the legislature who want to move the capital from Williamsburg further west, as much for convenience than anything, they also now can say, look, it's dangerous. The British Navy could sail right up the James and attack, or the York and attack, but if we're further into the inland, they can't do that. And so that's what's going to help propel uh, the capital from Williamsburg to Richmond. Now, guys, when I started this, I told you how important the capital and politics w was to, to Williamsburg, right? This is a death blow to them. And, and, and in a way, there's a little silver lining there. So the capital moves, uh, it takes a while, but the capital finally moves to, uh, to Richmond in April of 1780. And um, Williamsburg is now, you know, adjusting to all that. Meanwhile, in 1780, the war comes hard to the south. And so you've got the fall of Charleston. Why is that important to us? Most of the Virginia Continental Line is there trapped and captured. Um, then the British start having success in the south. Then Benedict Arnold turns traitor and is sent here. Another British expedition comes uh, in October just, just for a quick little uh, hit and the run. But then Benedict Arnold comes in 1781. All right, now Virginia becomes the focus of a lot of the war in 1781. And the south, by the way, North Carolina too. So right here, when Arnold shows up in, at the end of the year and then in, in January, he's only got 1,800 men. He sails up the river, love this, lands at Westover, marches to Richmond, and burns down the Capitol. 
Um, no, not really. He doesn't burn down all of it. He just burns down the public buildings and all that. Doesn't go to Williamsburg. He threatens. He actually um, almost goes to Williamsburg, but he, just, he decides against it. So then uh, he basically shakes the hornet's nest, sails back down, and goes to Portsmouth and sits in Portsmouth for the next two months, three months, occupying, and everything's kind of, um, kind of in limbo until reinforcements come. In April, those reinforcements, those British reinforcements under General Phillips, they do land. They do land right over here by, um, what's that place called, Kings Mill? Kings Mill, yeah. And they march into Williamsburg for two days. But from all my research, I can't find much, much account of what happened. Um, there's not a whole lot of damage done to Williamsburg. It's not an important city anymore because it's not the capital. And so uh, General Phillips, uh, who had spent some captivity here as a prisoner in Virginia, I don't think he, he, he burned anything down. He could have. I, can't, I don't know for sure. Um, but I don't think he burned down the barracks. I, mean, uh, I think Cornwallis probably did. Because when, what happens is um, Lord Cornwallis, Brit the British commander in, in the Carolinas, moves up into Virginia too. So, again, let me check on you. you, guys do all, you guys, all, everybody with me now? I'm in, this, I'm in this late spring, early summer of 1781. Arnold was here, and then Phillips joined him, and now Cornwallis has joined him. That's about 7,000 British, plus another reinforcement from New York, about 7,000 British soldiers. All we have is militia. The Virginia line is destroyed, just a few hundred men, poorly clothed, poorly equipped. General Lafayette is sent down, but he's got 1,000 men. So maybe we've got 2,000, maybe 3,000, it all depends because the militia come and go, to stand up against 7,000 Brits. Not a fair fight, and Lafayette's not, he's young, but he's not stupid, and he's not going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Cornwallis. And then we get this, this dance, this long dance that takes, basically, Cornwallis is, is, is pursuing uh, Lafayette almost all the way to Fredericksburg, and then cuts off, and then he sends detachments to Char Charlottesville to try to capture Jefferson, just misses Jefferson, and they do destroy a, a, a supply depot at point of fork, but for our story, what's important is then the British army marches back to Williamsburg, and they occupy Williamsburg for 10 days, okay? Now, um, I've got, <laughs> I've been blowing through my, my points here. I want to describe to you, I think I have it saved, because um, this is a 10-day occupation, so it's a little bit better documented. Let me see. One eighty five. Some of you will r relate to this. I love this actually. So um, there's not a whole lot about what it was like to live under British occupation, but there's enough. Um, here's a guy named St. George Tucker. Now the Tucker house was actually on Palace Green um, then, and now it's been moved over to that house adjoining, um, right across from the. Um, that beautiful Compton Oak and, and behind the courthouse. And so St. George Tucker, uh, he, he's my main source here, he talks about what, what has happened and how, it, how the, how there's hardship now to some of his friends uh, in, uh, in Williamsburg. I think he's writing to his wife. Our friend Mr. Madison, not James Madison, um, the future president, but a relative of Mr. Madison, I think it's his uncle. Uh, our friend Mr. Madison and his lady were turned out of their house to make room for Lord Cornwallis. So Lord Cornwallis made the um, president's house of William and Mary his headquarters. Happily, the college afforded them an asylum. They were refused the small privilege of drawing water from their own well, a contemptuous treatment, with the danger of starving were the only evils which he recounted as none of his servants left him. So what he just said there in a worded way was, none of Mr. Madison's servants left him. But, listen to this, poor Mr. McClurg has no small servant left and but two girls, servants. He feeds and saddles his own horse and is a philosopher enough to enjoy the good that springs from the absence of the British without repining at what he lost. So what he's saying is, poor Mr. McClurg has got to do more work now because his people have run off. Okay, same thing with Aunt Betty. Aunt Betty is Miss Elizabeth Randolph, the widow of Peyton Randolph. Um, she was actually taking care of a child, and um, a whole lot of her slaves ran off with the British when they were there and left, uh, left her in charge of this little young child herself. Oh, but this is the scene I really wanted to talk about on page 187. This is a Captain Johann Ewald describing what it's like to be in Williamsburg in the summer. Tell me if this doesn't strike a chord with you. 
For six weeks, the heat has been so unbearable that many men have been lost by sunstroke or their reason have been impaired. Everything that one has on his body is soaked, as with water from the constant perspiration. The nights are especially terrible when there is so little air that one can scarcely breathe. The torment of several billions of insects, which plagued us day and night, appears to be over now for certain. Okay, so I guess he's talking about after, after they move off to Portsmouth. But he's describing Winsburg almost to a T of what my experience has been in Virginia. It's like, what is wrong with this air? Why is it so thick and moist and I can't stop sweating? Um, and um, our friend St. George Tucker talks about, among the plagues the British left in Williamsburg, that of flies is inconceivable. It is impossible to eat, drink, sleep, write, sit still, or even walk about in peace on account of their confounding stings. Their number exceed all description. I don't know what he's talking about in terms of the flies that followed the British Army, but especially stinging flies. They don't sound like house flies. But, um, but it was mentioned more than once about you know, a plague of flies following the British Army. So Williamsburg is occupied, um, but only for 10 days. Cornwallis then leaves and goes off to, um, to Portsmouth. There's a battle over by Jamestown called Green Spring that was kind of significant, and General Lafayette dodged a bullet there. Um, now... That's July, and then we get into August, and then George Washington hatches his plan to come to Yorktown, and then uh, Lafayette is told to don't let Cornwallis leave Yorktown because in August, Cornwallis goes from Portsmouth to Yorktown. Why? Because he's been instructed to find a good winter harbor for the British Navy. And we all know it's still there today, right? The Navy still uses the York River. And so that's what he's decided. He, well, Cornwallis doesn't like Portsmouth, probably too many flies. He wants to come to Yorktown. And so now um, Lafayette goes into Williamsburg. And yesterday is the anniversary of General Washington's arrival. And so that was a big deal. When Washington and Rochambeau showed up to Williamsburg, um, there was quite a bit of excitement. So um, I talk about that a lot in the book and what's going on and going on. And then that leads us to Yorktown. I don't focus on Yorktown. There's a great book about Yorktown already out there. So I'm going to focus on what happened in Williamsburg, you know, the hospitals that are there, and also the, um, um, the, the troops that were left behind to defend. Because, you know, I never ever thought of this until I read Washington's letter. He was afraid that Cornwallis would send a force up the York River to Queens Creek and then attack Williamsburg from behind. So he had to leave almost 1,000 men in Williamsburg defend, to defend the town from a possible kind of sneak attack like that. Um, now, I hope I'm getting ahead of myself again. So what happens? We're almost at the end, guys. So what happens here is obviously Yorktown, uh, the, 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 really it's a two-week siege, although you, the British are here for a long time, but it starts in uh, late September and it goes to October 19th. Um, and then the, the surrender there is very, very, very significant. For our story here, though, I want to talk about what happens after Yorktown. Washington leaves. He sends a lot of his troops, uh, the Pennsylvanians and, and such, down to the Carolinas, and he leads the other more northern troops up north, but the French stay. And I want to kind of close this by sharing with you some French accounts. Um, let me share the very first French account, though. I forgot. I blew right through it. I thought it was kind of funny. Um, and, and that, you know, as you, when you're writing and you want to get it right, you're always looking for eyewitness accounts. So this one was written in 1765. I know this is not great. I'm going back 15 years now. But I, I meant to share this with you. This is a Frenchman visiting Williamsburg in 1765, and this is what he says. Never was a more disagreeable place than this at present. In the daytime, people hurrying back and forth from the capital to the taverns, and at night, carousing and drinking in one chamber, and box and dice in another, which continued till morning commonly. There is not a public house in Virginia, a tavern, but have their tables all battered with the boxes, uh, which shows the extravag extravagant disposition of the planters. So what he's saying is, it sounds like uh, spring break, Daytona, uh, you know, Florida, everybody's out there, woo, you know, gambling and drinking and, the, and all that. Now let's hear what the, Brit Fr the French army says. When they stay, and they, I know they had to be happy to stay in Williamsburg because the winter before <laughs> in New York and in Rhode Island was horrible. So here's what he says. Um, this is a French officer uh, in 1782. One could not be more 
One could not be more hospitable than are the inhabitants of Williamsburg to all the army officers. They receive them very cordially in their homes and do all in their power to provide entertainment for them. In this city, the fair sex, although they are not the prettiest, I have, se I have seen form a very agreeable and general, and in general, very well-bred society. These people, here's another one, these people are very hospitable and receive you in a most cordial manner, but they are exceptionally lazy. The gentlemen, as well as those who claim to be, but are not, live like lords. Like all Americans, they are generally cold, but the women are warmer. They have the advantages of being much gayer by nature than the northern women, though not so pretty. Hmm. They love pleasure and are passionately fond of dancing, in which they indulge in both summer and winter. When a gentleman goes out of his house, something he does rarely, he is always followed by a Negro groom who rides behind him. Okay, now, now we get closer to the end of their stay and it's getting warm again. Here's the French perspective. We just had the German perspective from Ewald. We suffered greatly from the heat. The nights seemed even hotter than the days. We did not know where to turn. Added to this discomfort was an invasion of gnats whose bite is far more venomous than those of Europe. During the summer, it is impossible to go out of the house in the daytime. The houses are designed to stay cool, being built around a large hall and vestibule with a cross draft running through it. This serves as a sitting room. Blah, blah, blah. Um, in the evening, you go out, but you do not stay long outdoors since the dampness of the night air is dangerous. The Americans stand the heat better than we do, or at least they are less sensitive to it. But again, he's just, he's just describing... Um, he's just describing well, we all know, the heat and humidity of Virginia. All right, the French leave. The French leave, and when they leave, that's it for Williamsburg. Williamsburg is no longer going to be a, a place of importance. Um, and in fact, I've, my last few pit images I have here just show you kind of the ruins. That is the governor's palace that, was, that burned down remnants of the governor's palace, and that, uh, that's the excavated site. That's a building that was still standing uh, when, when photography was around. Um, I, I don't know, I'm not 100% sure where all these um, it, the locations are in the town, but I want to close with this. I want to close with this one account of a visitor a year after the French leave and how they describe the town, and that is, the place has suffered and is suffering. The palace, the barracks, and some good dwelling houses burnt. The capital is no great building and is going to ruin. The exterior of the college, not splendid, and but few students. And then one other, February 1783. Williamsburg is now a poor place compared with its former splendor. With the removal of the government, merchants, advocates, and other considerable res residents took their departure as well, and the town has lost half its population. The trade of this place was never great, its distance from waters, navigable waters, uh, not being favorable to more active affairs. The inhabitants of this town and of all lower Virginia desire greatly that the seat of government return, but it won't. All right, and I close the book there by explaining that that's a silver lining for all of us, right? Because Williamsburg essentially becomes a ghost town, almost like one of those old western ghost towns, just kind of falls apart. But in doing so, it doesn't see the development that, say, a, a Richmond will see, or any other big important town. All the, look at Boston. Boston's a great city, right? Philadelphia's a great city. But those little historic areas are just kind of confined and surrounded by all this you know, modern, modern buildings. Williamsburg just decays, and then in the, 19, uh, in the, in the 20th century, um, Dr. Goodwin and, um, and John D. Rockefeller get together and say, let's bring it back. They wouldn't have been able to do that. That's what I'm saying. They wouldn't have been able to do that if Williamsburg had remained the capital because there would have been more and more new development, so they couldn't, there wouldn't have been anything to base it on. But because the capital moved away, uh, to Richmond, we get Williamsburg today. And that's where I had my presentation. And I'm open to any questions, and thank you for your time. Um, and that's it. Thank you, thank you Mike. Uh, we're now going to have a, a short uh, question and answer period. Um, but I ask you, if you have a question, please raise your hand. I'll get the microphone to you, because we need to use this mic in order to, to get, the, uh, get your questions recorded. So first question, anybody? Uh oh, that's never a good sign. There we go. Thank you. I am a Yorktown loyalist. Ah, loyalist. <laughs> and I wondered how come 
You never mentioned uh, Thomas Nelson and his role with the Virginia militia. Well, my focus was on Williamsburg. That's a good point. You know, Nelson, obviously, Nelson, the story of Thomas Nelson is, is amazing, you know, and what he sacrificed and all that. And he was going to be a governor. But because I focused just on Williamsburg, I, I, I admitted a lot of my heroes. And Nelson is definitely one of my heroes. So I apologize. I, I meant no offense. I understand. I understand. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, the, the title, Williamsburg at War, that, that, that's why. But I, I, I've got a friend, Jim Gallagher, could, he does Thomas Nelson. He could probably give you an amazing talk on Thomas Nelson. And he's going to next month. Oh, there you go. Good, good. Another question. The, the set, oh, okay. The, my question is a little off base from what you've been talking about. But that's okay. Greg and I, my friend here, ride bicycles over in the surrender field mm -hmm. and it's absolutely amazing you read all the placards and you see all the little forts and the places and we go over there when it's 95 degrees and humid as heck and the mosquitoes and the bugs are biting you the billions and billions of them and we just wonder how in the world could groups of these people of 800 a thousand and so how could they live all these pictures that you see in the news, the uniforms are yeah. all spotless, they're all beautiful, and there's nothing. Yeah, how, well. How, how did they survive? Well, I can tell you they probably weren't spotless in reality. <laughs> no, I've had that same thought. I remember working over at the Jamestown Fort um, several years ago at the end of the day, July day, and I'm sitting there melting, just melting. And I'm like, how in the world? I get to go into my car drive home in air condition, blasting on me, then jump into a shower and, you know, get refreshed. They had no escape. And so the same thing. They talk about uh, on a September 28th when they marched from Williamsburg to Yorktown, the, the American, the Allied Army, that men are dropping because it was warm. And, then, and, and, and it wasn't July warm. It was September, you know, maybe Indian summer warm. But, you know, they're right. They're wearing wool uniforms, which don't make a lot of sense sometimes. But, you know. Yeah. How did they... Who provided their food, their water for the horses? Uh, no, it was, and, and uh, the, 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 the best documented person in the entire revolution is obviously General Washington. And, and that's a topic that comes up a lot, you know, throughout his entire war. I mean, how did they keep that going? It's, it's a story that I don't know if anybody's ever really divulged, I mean, focused on it in, in detail, at least all over the whole scope of the, camp, of the eight years. But it's, a, it's, it's amazing, and we all overlook that stuff, don't we? The, the logistics, the important stuff. You know, the army fight, uh, marches on its stomach. This no. gentleman had a question. So I don't have an answer for you on myself. I understand they did a lot of time in the taverns. Did they actually do any fighting in Williamsburg? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, the, the, the Civil War, there was fighting in Williamsburg. Uh, and there was, there, there was a, a small little encounter where um, some of uh, the college company sold uh, troops. The Will William and Mary College Company, or Co William and Mary College, formed a company of men. And I think they took some pot shots at the British in the summer, I think, when they were occupying. But it was nothing substantial. The big fights around Williamsburg were at Spencer's Ordinary. So you go over to James City County, there's a park called Freedom Park. And it was right there, right at that intersection. And then, of course, um, uh, Green Spring over Battle by James. Green Springs. Yeah, yes. yeah, that, and that was twice as big as, as uh, Spencer's Ordinary. And then um, there might have been some small little, small little in, uh, encounters, almost like patrols, drift, uh, cavalry patrols prior to Yorktown. Um, but yeah, Williamsburg was spared any serious fighting. Okay, I had one other question about. Do you have any idea how many? Vessels uh, are in the James River from the Revolutionary War. I don't. I don't. You know, all, I know uh, that a bulk of, of the fleet was scuttled, and I don't know. I don't know how many remain there, or you know. It's, it, I wish I did. I know. That I'm sure there's there are people over at the American American Revolution Museum at Yorktown. We always call it Army. Um, they, that they would know. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, maybe you know, Mike. You know, I want to ask you a question. Oh, okay. Do you have your book for sale downstairs? <laughs> yes. We are my, yep, both, several of my books are. Good. For, uh, what I want to question, the question I wanted to have is, what one single thing do you think happened in Williamsburg during the Revolutionary War that was the most important? 
Wow. Because you got a lot well, to choose from. I know. But I w I'd be interested in your opinion on that. All right. I would put, um, I would put, uh, well, the, the vote for independence it jumps out. That affects all of us. The, the vote for independence on May 15th, we ought to, we ought to make that a, you know, a special day, commemorate that. The Gunpowder Incident magazine, that was huge. That was a really big deal. Um, and then that meetings in the Raleigh Tavern right before, uh, in 1774. Um, so those are the three that, that jump right out at me as, as important. That's why your book is so important, a um, copy of it, is because you're covering events that Williamsburg is great, every place has local history, but that local history had international impact. Yes. So yeah. that's why your book's a great one. Oh. So thank you. I thank you for that comment. Thank you. Any, Any, oh, another question. Oh, here we go. Um, could you talk about the cemetery behind the palace? The, the, um, well, the palace was used as a, as a hospital, um, mm -hmm. uh, the American hospital. The French were using actually uh, one of the college buildings as a hospital, and then it burned down uh, or after Yorktown. And then the palace also burned down um, uh, after the Yorktown, too. Now, I don't know how many, how many graves they found. Do you know more? Um, 156 yeah. graves behind the palace? Yeah, so... Okay, so that's uh, clearly pr likely coming from uh, coming from the. Uh, well, I don't know. If they, no, I don't think they're bringing the bodies back to Yorktown. I think they would have been. They would have died in the palace. Um, boy, I just thought of that. I don't know if they have the palaces there. Ghost tour. One of their ghost tour stops. But you know, if you have that many people perishing, and like like every war, uh, you know, prior to, uh, prior to the twentieth century, illness is killing more soldiers than, than battle wounds and such. So I don't know a lot about where the location of that is. They don't really highlight that, you know, very well and didn't occur to me to dig into that. Yeah. Yeah. Over by the maze? Yeah. Yeah. There's, a, there's another um, over by the Griffin Hotel. There's a, um, my friend Mark Schneider, who plays uh, General Lafayette, um, has been tending. He actually goes out there and takes care of some French graves. And, of course, we have French graves over here in Yorktown, too, don't we? And, oh, more questions. I love it. This is great. Excuse me. This might seem like a weird question, but I'm sort of... You, when you say they went from this place to that place to that place to the other place, and I mean, I know how long it would take me to walk, but I mean, generally, say he went from Williamsburg to York to, to Richmond. How long would it take a trip for like back in that time? How long would it take a trip like that? Well, it sounds like you're probably talking about Arnold, uh, or, or what, it depends on where you're talking about. Uh, if you're doing it by the river, Right, you just following the tide up, uh, probably uh, to going with the tide flowing up. Except the then you mostly coming down. When well, the current's through. coming down, right? So you'll probably make better time coming down. But when the tide goes up, you uh, it depends on the wind too. But I can't imagine they they sailed up uh, in some of these vessels. They just had to float. I, I, this is I've thought about this a lot. You got to be a lot more patient in this time period than <laughs> than back then because it takes a while. But Arnold made very rapid uh, rapid. Um, um, advance up the river in January of, of 81. Now walking, I've seen other, and some of my other research, um, you don't see anything over 30 miles, very rarely, unless you're Tarleton chasing Colonel Buford <laughs> to hit him at the Waxhaws, and then he did 105 miles in 54 hours. But that was on horseback. And uh, so, you know, usually you're talking about marches of 15 miles, 20 miles, and, th and then the heat, they, I think that's hard. Yeah, and you get stragglers all strung out. No, I agree with you. It's it's a different world for sure. You know, it's you don't run up to Richmond for a day uh, in that time period. Marching at 120, 120 paces a minute. That's you know, and you at 120. I mean, yeah, I don't think they're going that far. That's about three miles an hour. Oh, okay, okay, three miles is. A good clip. Uh, is that 120 paces? I didn't realize that. Well, 30 in, 30 in pace. Hmm? 
Yeah, three miles, two to three miles is your standard that I've always seen. Um, that, I, with Washington. Yeah. When Washington did um, Trenton, he fell way behind schedule and had to make it up and was still two hours late. Um, uh, but uh, they were going at a faster clip. Sir, in the red shirt, you had a question, sir? Yeah, I had a question. Did, uh, you mentioned Tarleton. His reputation is so bad. Based in Williamsburg, the Cornwallis, did he do a lot of raids or create a lot of damage? No, he, I wouldn't say he did a lot of damage at all, uh, but, he, but he was um, involved as a commander of horse. Uh, he was involved with um, a lot of scouting. And I think it was Tarleton who saw Washington's first approach when they first showed up in, in, in September 28. I think it was Tarleton and his force that watched them um, over by, it's, it's part of the American encampment now, um, part of the, the loop road of uh, Yorktown. But yeah, Tarleton didn't do any of the, you know, he's, he's known for the wax saws and, and some of the other things in the Carolinas. But here, I wouldn't say he, said he did anything out. Uh, of course, the Battle of the Hook across the river, too. I think we're probably going to have to wrap it up at this point. Um, I'd like to thank Mike Cicere for a very entertaining and informative presentation. Um, and before I uh, turn you loose, I'd like to uh, make a, a couple of uh, well, more than a couple, about four short announcements. Uh, first of all, as we mentioned, uh, Mike will be available downstairs for sale and signing of some of his books, including the one that uh, he covered today. The York, um, the York County Historical Committee's compiled history of York County is, uh, book is available uh, just outside the door here for sale at the incredible low price of $20, and uh, that's certainly something you should consider. They're also available in the gallery downstairs. We'd like to invite you to visit the York County Historical Museum. It's located in the basement of this building. It's one of the uh, hidden gems of York County. It's open for just a little bit longer to, uh, this afternoon, but um, at, your, at the earliest opportunity, I'd ask you to take advantage of, of this this, as I said, a hidden gem. We'd also like to invite you to our next lecture, which is October the 29th, uh, titled Thomas Nelson and the Yorktown Tea Party. Yay. And I imagine many of you didn't know until you came here this afternoon that Yorktown had its own tea party. So you can come to the lecture and learn all about it. Um, Nelson will be portrayed by Jim Gallagher, who has uh, portrayed him in a number of venues. If you would like to receive notice of upcoming uh, lectures, uh, we've uh, put a box outside the door here. Uh, so you can put your email address on one of the slips, drop it in the box, and we'll add you to our mailing list. So again, that wraps it up for, uh, for today. Thank you very much for coming and hope you enjoyed it.